Okay, this is Dr. Morton, Morton dictating a uh, uh, lecture for uh, Monday the 28th. Yeah, and uh, for uh, DSD. And this will be DSD, I think it's DSD 14. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so let's first take a look at the syllabus. And uh, it's here. And I, I think maybe I'll shrink me down a little bit here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, here we are on the 28th. Uh, and we should be through with three, but we're not going to be, but we're not. So we're going to have to do three. And um, so uh, we're going to sort of move along here. Um, Yeah, and I don't know that we're going to do this. Uh, yeah, so I don't know that we're going to do. Uh, I'm not sure that the test schedule will work out. It may be so. We may do this theory test on chapters two, two through four. We'll see. Anyway, but that'll be mid October or the second week of October. Um, yeah, five, seven, nine, and yeah, second, essentially the second week of October. Okay. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, so, so we didn't quite finish three, but we will. Uh, we'll hopefully get that done today. And so, I'll put this over here. Uh, okay, and then uh, there we are. And uh, oops, I messed that up. Okay, so uh, I wanted to show you this because I I went online just to kind of update things. So. Uh, I, I looked at the prices, and uh, the cheapest the cheapest CPLDs were just a little under two dollars, a dollar seventy nine, dollar ninety nine, um, and and an awful lot of them were in the two dollar, three dollar, four dollar, five dollar, ten dollar range. Uh, there were a f there were some really big ones. I think up to three hundred fifty k gates that were maybe up, you know, $28, $30, $68 was the most expensive one I saw uh, in DigiKey's uh, catalog. Anyway, and there were there were a number of people uh, selling them. Um, so they're still out there, still used, and they're fairly inexpensive uh, for, you know, the, the modest size ones. Uh, 68 bucks seems like a lot for a CPLD, but, uh, but I guess 350 gates, it can probably do quite a bit. Uh, so... Okay, we, we already did look at this slide, so I'm just going to shoot through. And we looked at this one, I think. Um, and you can see here, uh, now logic cells and gates are totally different. The logic cells, uh, I'll have to go through the definition. Uh, the DSP slices and the logic slices, uh, I don't know. Anyway, they're, they're, but the logic cells, I think they have two LUT7s, uh, a couple of flip-flops, and a bunch of multiplexers and some uh, and some some or chain or and chain gates as well. Uh, so they're they're quite a bit more than a than a gate. Uh, and in the chip we're using, we have 215,000 of them. So uh, and I don't know what our chip costs. I should price it sometime. Uh, I bet it's I bet it's 50 bucks or so. Um, all right. Well, anyway, we looked at this, so I'm gonna bump ahead. Uh, so mask programmable gate arrays, MPGAs. So the MPGAs, uh, they have these uh, an array of gates, but you have to create a custom mask, and this has to be designed and engineered. The chip is already, uh, in many cases, mostly manufactured, but uh, but not completely manufactured, and I don't know how they store them to preserve them, but I guess they figured out a way or maybe they don't even manufacture them until you're ready to use them. But in any event, uh, uh, when you're ready to use them, uh, a, uh, a metallic mask then gets in, in created and is, it is added on to the, cut, to, the, to the standard chip. So that part of the chip up to the custom mask is standard, but then the custom mask is specifically designed for your application. 
Uh, so it's only factory programmable, and there's clearly going to be some significant turnaround time because you have to get this scheduled in the foundry, which may be busy making other chips. Um, and they may then they would just add you to their schedule. Their schedule might be full out for a few months. So you, you could have a, a significant delay compared to programming your own FPGA and, and shipping whenever you felt like it uh, because those FPGAs are off-the-shelf items. Um, and obviously, if you make a mistake or you need to make a change, nope, you got to start over and you have to, uh, you have to generate the new mask. Um, might not be as hard as generating the first mask, but still, it's going to take some work and it's also going to cause some expense. Uh, all right, um, so the advantages of FPGAs, these are standard off-the-shelf products. You can go on DigiKey or Mauser or um, Element 14 or any of those or whatever, and you can just order them. Um, you, can, uh, you, can, you, can, you don't have to have any custom mask or anything like that. And you can reprogram, uh, reprogram them a number of times. Uh, you can program them in in your own house in shop. Uh, you don't have to do them. Uh, you don't have to have them done at the factory, and uh, so your time to market can be very quick, because you uh, uh, because you can just buy these off the shelf, get them in a few days, program them yourself, and ship your product. Um, and very flexible. If you make a mistake, it's not a big deal. You just regenerate a new bit file. Uh, now, that might take a few hours of computer time, but it's certainly nothing like a mass programmable gate array where you have to come up with a new mask and then uh, get a photo mask for that new mask and then have the foundry do a run of, you know, some number, perhaps a large number. And if they uh, have defective masks, uh, you could wind up paying a lot of money. You're, I, don't, I don't know how you could possibly get a, a smaller volume that when, what would fit on one wafer uh, so and they might not want to run a, an entire process just for one wafer so I don't know but but uh, uh, clearly they're if, in small volumes uh, FPGAs are going to be cheaper than a than a than a mask programmable gate array or a custom chip either one okay so um, so there are some disadvantages, though. One of the disadvantages is that uh, that the fact that they're field programmable means that there's a whole bunch of additional circuitry uh, on the chip in it to enable you to program the 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 circuitry on the chip you want to use, and uh, so that programmable capability uh, definitely creates uh, adds a lot of transistors to the to the to the FPGA. And making it much bigger, much uh, more power hungry uh, than if it were a custom chip and you didn't have that, and it was already pre-programmed to do exactly what you wanted. So, so, uh, so that field programmability comes with a cost. Uh, there are definitely delays through this uh, big interconnect matrix. A lot more uh, parasitic uh, capacitances and and uh, and and. Uh, additional resistances involved, uh, so you do have to deal with with uh, the fact that uh, at at certain clock speeds uh, they're not going to be as fast as a comparable custom integrated circuit, or even for that matter, a CPLD. CPLD is going to have fairly predictable uh, uh, connection lines because it's all going to be in the mask, and you're going to know exactly what that looks like. Um, and because of all these other transistors that are required uh, in order to make it programmable, it's going to use more power, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, so here's some. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, it doesn't even uh, list our uh, uh, our chip. Here, and here's some other. Oh, these are so these are popular Xilinx. These are, but this is old. So don't even pay attention to this. Uh, Vertex and uh, and Artrix are are really their frontline uh, products now, and these are pretty much older stuff. Same with this, and uh, I think uh, I think Actel was I think Actel was purchased by Microchip. Have to have to go through that, but I did just put a slide in, so I'm going to skip through this because these are not 
Um, so in 2006, this was kind of the market share. But again, some of these companies have already been bought. So take that with a grain of salt. Uh, in 2020, uh, this is th these are the big players in the FPGA security market. So uh, Microchip didn't even have FPGAs uh, back in uh, 06 and 10, but they do now, uh, and so they're they're stepping up. Uh, and of course, Xilinx, Altera, Lattice, and then Acronix and E2V. Uh, there there still are even today three basic types of FPGAs. There are FPGAs that are based on making them programmable by using static RAM, and that's uh, all the Xilinx chips, or at least all the FPGAs for Xilinx fall into this category. And then there are other ones that are, that are based on uh, blowing fuses, uh, uh, and these are probably just one-time programmable. Um, and, uh, and then there are flash-based FPGAs. Uh, where, where it's just like your microprocessor, you flash the bit file into the flash memory, and then you can erase it and reprogram it. And <clears throat> what's nice is these flash-based FPGAs still have their program when they're powered down. The SRAM lose their program when they're powered down and have to be re reprogrammed on power up. Now, uh, Xilinx makes that as easy as you can make it. Uh, they provide... A, a, just you know a whole laundry list of different ways you can do it and they'll you know they'll give you there's all sorts of uh, uh, helper guides to show you how to hook it up uh, you can put on a, a standalone flash memory you can you can you can put on EE proms you can put on a whole bunch of stuff you can have them connected to a server uh, there's a lot of things you can do to to to, uh, uh, to program them on power up and <clears throat> I guess you might even say uh, that there is one feature which means that uh, that uh, you could dynamically change the program while you know while your while your machine is running you can uh, reprogram the FPGA and have it uh, be reconfigured to do something entirely some other entirely different process but it's unlike it doesn't it's hard to see where that would be super helpful uh, seems like a, a feature that might not be used all that much and um, and the so the, maybe the one downside is that um, the, the requirement to be programmed at power up is is a little bit of a downside, but I guess they make up for it by being uh, bigger and more powerful because they they have a big chunk of the market. Uh, let's see, uh, did it did it say what it said back here? Yeah, fifty fifty one point five percent in two thousand six, and I think they're still somewhere in that range. They they have a big market share. Um, Okay, and then, uh, yeah, I think we covered all this. Here, the mar out to 2025, one of the big, uh, 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 you know, company that does all these uh, tech reports uh, projects this. Uh, if you want to get the whole report, uh, you have to cough up about, uh, you know, a couple thousand dollars. Maybe it's more than that. I think it's at least a couple thousand dollars. Uh, but they put out some, um, you know, uh, general information to try and get people to, to buy it and they see markets in the area of telecommunications and consumer electronics and so forth all these things out to 2025 for FPGAs okay there are have been a number of architectures um, and I, I you know I'm not sure what difference it really makes nor will I necessarily test you on this or anything like that um, but here they have uh, you know, sort of a matrix format with logic blocks and all these interconnect lines running between them, like a little matrix. These are row-based, uh, where you have the logic bo blocks next to each other, and then you have rows in between them, uh, where you run your interconnect lines. Uh, we have we have a, a sea of gates uh, and this uh, here that's like a programmable logic device sort of uh, base. So there are lots and lots of different, uh, uh, I'm sure since, since this is old, there are lots of new architectures. Um, so, uh, so routing with static RAM. So, so remember Xilinx uses static RAM. So that's what our board's working on. And we have to, you know, that's why if you turn it off, your program is gone. Um, 
But you can put it on a on a little SD card and plug the SD card in, and it'll automatically reprogram itself from the SD card every time you power it up. It takes about four or five. It takes about maybe ten seconds. It takes a while. Uh, but the nice thing is that uh, that, uh, that that that's fairly easy to implement. You just set a jumper and put the bit file in the root directory of the SD card, and away it goes. All right. So here. This will show you how the static RAM cells uh, control some things. So we have a routing wire here, and the RAM cell controls the switch that connects A with B or B with A, but it doesn't. It either turns on or off. Here, then, we have a uh, uh, another routing wire, and the RAM cell works like this. And this is where I guess this would be maybe one directional. This is bi-directional. And then we have uh, some routing wires here, and uh, we have a couple of RAM cells that uh, are, since this is a uh, 4 to 1 MUX, you have con two control bits. So here's one control bit, and there's the other control bit. Um, I guess, yeah, we did. So um, how many... How many static RAM cells does it take, or, or, or sorry, how many, uh, how many transistors for each static RAM cell? And so that's that's interesting. So what do you what's what's the what's the load? And so let's look at that. So here, a typical static RAM cell takes six transistors. One, two, three, four, five, six. You have a word line. You have a bit line. And here's how it's set up. So that's what a static RAM cell looks like, six transistors. So you can see when you add uh, uh, a routing wire here, a bidirectional routing wire there, uh, and a, uh, and, uh, a two bit control for the mu multiplexer, you're adding, you're adding uh, uh, you know 12 RAM cells here, six and six. So it's significant. Um, so the uh, EEPROM programming technology are, are uh, it may be, uh, in this case, it's whenever you see just EEPROM, it normally means it's, it's going to be either one-time programmable with no window, or if it has a window, then it's erasable with ultraviolet light. Um, so you have, you have this floating gate, and uh, you, can, you can put a higher voltage on this line and force a, uh, and force a charge on the gate. That will control this uh, this uh, this transistor. Um, you can, if you expose it to ultraviolet light, you can get that that floating gate, the charge on there, to leak off. And generally, what happens is the charge the charge will put this into if it's uh, if it's if there's no charge on the floating gate, then usually it, it reads a one because it's pulled up. And then it's it's pulled down the ground when there is a floating when there is a uh, uh, when the, when there's a charge on that floating gate. So when you erase it with ultraviolet light, you switch everything to ones because they're all pulled up. Okay, and you program them to zeros. Uh, and then the EEPROM, uh, you can you can apply you can electrically erase those just by putting a big differential voltage here. Uh, across from the bit line and the uh, word line. All right, so here are the major FPGA programming technologies. Uh, static RAM, EEPROM, EEPROM, and most of these now have migrated to Flash and the Anti-Fuse. So the Anti-Fuse is not reprogrammable. Um, but it takes up very small amounts of tris, tri, chip area, and uh, it makes a very uh, uh, low resistance connection. You know, uh, connection with very little parasitic capacitance. Whereas the static RAM uh, takes six transistors for every bit, um, but it is in circuit reprogrammable. Whereas uh, the anti-fuse is, is not reprogrammable. So that takes away one of the real benefits of your. Um, uh, of your FPGA, and then it has fairly high resistance and some and significant parasitic capacitance, 
and you can think uh, pretty much EE prom. I don't think we're doing any uh, any ultraviolet erasable stuff anymore. We're, that that that's kind of gone because uh, it's a little bit inconvenient. Uh, usually, you have to pull the chip out of the circuit to to erase it because you can't get the ultraviolet light exposure to be adequate inside the circuit typically, um, and pulling it out and plugging it back in, that's a big hassle. And so we, we much prefer the in-circuit reprogrammable. Or, uh, and then if you want to go cheap and, uh, and low, low size, low resistance, low capacitance, then, 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 the fact, then essentially the one-time programmable anti-fuse technology might be the one to go for. Um, so, um, so here's another, here's, so, so what's programmable? That's one of the things to think about. So uh, generally, we have, uh, we have this, uh, we have these individual uh, I.O. blocks on every pin. And every pin that's, uh, that's a data pin and not a power or ground pin on this board, uh, and there's some, and there are some special things. I think there's some analog inputs and some stuff like that, but, but, uh, but but on this chip, uh, essentially all the general, you know, GPIO pins basically, uh, all these pins can be programmed for output, programmed for input. They can be programmed for a whole a whole uh, bunch of voltage levels, and you you should have seen that in the first tutorial. Um, and and these are programmable. And what's interesting is the it's it's the it's the uh, the top module port list that gives the the input or output direction. But it's the, uh, but then it's 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 the configuration, uh, the constraint file that uh, uh, that sets up uh, the voltages, but not the not the direction of the port. Inter interestingly enough, um, and then we have these programmable logic blocks and interconnect matrix. So this is, you know, so so we're going to look now at how these things get programmed. How do you program the interconnect matrix? How do you program the logic blocks? How do you program the I/O blocks? Okay, so so first we'll do look at the logic blocks. So now this this is old because they're 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 looking at four or five variable LUTs. We ours are six and seven, um, and uh, so that's what that's what the the Artrix chip uses. Uh, some are our programmable logic type base where you have a set of input AND gates and an output OR gate or whatever. Uh, some of them have uh, mostly multiplexers. Uh, some of them have NAND NAND orientation. Uh, some of them are, are transistor transistor logic. And there's a whole bunch of different names. Um, here is the LUT based logic block example. So this shows a LUT4. Our, our, chip, our chips are LUT6s and you can gang together to have a LUT7. Um, and so you have, so ours have six inputs in each of these, and if you put them together, you can get seven, uh, because you can use the multiplexer to select between X and Y for the seventh bit, or for the seventh variable. Um, you, typically a couple of flip-flops, uh, and you, you can skip the flip-flop if you want with this multiplexer, or you can select the output of the flip-flop. Uh, so let's say you want to implement uh, a prime B prime C plus A prime B C prime plus A B. Okay, so uh, so how would that look? So you just have A B C. So you only need three inputs, but you have four. So uh, so let's see how that would work. Uh, so in this case, uh, we're going to put together A B prime A prime B prime C. So that would be uh, A prime, B prime, C. So that's a one there. A prime, B, C prime. A prime, B, C prime. That's a one there. And A, B. A, B is basically when you have A and B. So that's these two rows here. One, one, and one, one. And C doesn't matter. So that gives you one, two, three, four ones. And you can implement this with one LUT three, much less a LUT four. Uh, so to do this with a multiplexer-based logic block, uh, here you have uh, 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 two to one muxes, three of them, and 
so that makes a four to one mux. And then we have uh, uh, a flip flop here. And we have these inputs and our selection lines S1 and S0. So if you want to implement A prime B prime C plus A prime B C prime plus AB, what we just looked at, here's how you do it. Uh, so remember you can implement any three variable problem with a four variable mux. I mean with a four to one mux. So you have to you have to set divide your truth table up into pairs of rows and then you look and see. So in this case, your output follows C. So this is so this row would drive C. Here the output is the opposite of C, so that would be C prime. And then here you have uh, zero for both, so that would just be the output zero constant. And here it's one for both, so that would just be a one. And so now you've used uh, three, uh, you've used this four to one mux, which was made up of three two to ones to implement this, uh, this expression. So that's, that's, that shows that uh, those multiplexers are fairly powerful. All right. And these are the two, the A, A and B drive the select the cell lines. And then C is just routed to the input or not, uh, or either ground or power is routed to it. Or C is our inverse C. So here's how you implement it. Uh, so you're going to put A and B down here, and you're going to put C, C prime, 0, and 1. All right, let's look at how do you program these interconnects. So we have this general purpose sort of uh, 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 interconnect block that's basically. A lot of a lot of six-way switches is what it is. A lot of six-way switches. So let's look at our six-way switch. So so each of these spots would be a six-way switch. Now what does that mean? Well, like say B1. So six-way means you can you can you can go you can connect these two lines. 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 So that's one, two three, four switches, and then you can go straight through five or horizontally or vertically, six. So that's the, that's the six, six way switch. So you can, you have, you, you can, you can steer, you can connect these in a bunch of different ways. Now the, the, the signals can f flow either direction. So how do we actually, so how do we, how do we hook these up? Um, they can be between logic blocks, or you can just have a big dense interconnect matrix, um, and you have these global lines. So I thought there was a place. Um, yeah. So so we have interconnects here. Uh, this is called non-segmental channel routing, segmental channel channel routing. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know we're not gonna deal with this. If if we're dealing with a few switch, then you then you just uh, then, then you can blow these and make it make it direct whichever way you want. Um, so uh, now we're going to look at the programmable I/O blocks. We uh, we didn't see how the RAM, uh, what it takes in the way of transistors to implement these six-way switches, and to program them. But I think that that I know that comes up later. I thought it was here. All right. Well, anyway, we have a programmable logic block here. So what do those look like? Something like this. I mean, they obviously are. Uh, uh, both more complicated than this and the, or varied. So you have a bunch of configuration bits, which are which would be uh, in the case of a RAM-based chip like ours, these would be RAM cells. Uh, in the case of a, a EEPROM, they would be EEPROM locations. Um, or, um, and then in case of uh, uh, the, the the blown diodes, and they would be uh, and they would just be diodes that would be connected, blown uh, to force a connection. So, so you can have uh, you can have a, a, a three. You can have this output enable, which allows turns on the output. You can have uh, an invert the output. You can have a uh, uh, you can in, you can do the you can invert the three state uh, control signal. Uh, you can latch the output. You can uh, 
change the slew rate, and you can have a passive pull-up here. So these are all the configuration bits. And then you have you have a uh, you have a, a flip-flop up here, and and then you have uh, another one down here. This one uh, then can provide a voltage reference, uh, can give you global reset capability, um, and uh, and this is used on the input, and this is used on the output, and they're both driven by clocks, obviously. So here are the various voltage levels that, that uh, are typically available. Low voltage TTL, peripheral component interconnect, low voltage CMOS, uh, low voltage positive emitter coupled, stub series terminated logic, and other stuff. So you can read through these, uh, including these high speed transceivers. And, and uh, I think our, our chip has a, a whole bunch of selections that you can choose from. So every I.O. block's got these got these various capabilities. Um, now, besides just our logic cells and the interconnect matrix in our I.O. blocks, we also have the ability uh, to, to have uh, uh, block RAM or dedicated memory. Um, and then we, we do have some special arithmetic units, typically multipliers. Uh, our chip, I don't think, has any dividers, but it does have some multipliers. And then we do have some uh, some uh, digital signal processing blocks where you can do uh, where you can do FFTs uh, uh, and um, other 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 filtering uh, and uh, mathematical uh, operations. So we have here. Um, And um, also uh, infinite impulse response, finite impulse response filters in these digital signal processing blocks. You can also, uh, you can create what we call soft cores or they can be hard cores. If they're built into the FPGA, we call them hard cores. If you have to program them in, uh, they're soft cores. Um, and then you can also have these content addressable memories. Uh, content addressable memories are typically used uh, in things like routers and high-speed switchers for uh, internet connections. Uh, and this is where the, 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 the uh, it's a special kind of memory where the, the content is used to search. And uh, it just means that you can, uh, you can find which, uh, which output you want very, very quickly uh, because it uh, immediately addresses the location uh, with the name. Okay, so uh, our chip has uh, this Xilinx, uh, the uh, Artrix, uh, has an 18 by 18 uh, multiplier built, uh, maybe, maybe several of them. And just one quick comment on this. So, so let's say you want to multiply by a power of 2. So you always want to shift and not multiply uh, because you're, you'll tie up one of your multipliers if you don't. Now it's probably it's probable that the uh, uh, that the synthesizer will pick that up and fix it for you, but but you should just know that anytime you're you're multiplying or dividing by a power of two, it's much more effective to shift than it is to uh, than it is uh, to actually use a multiplier or do a divide operation. Um, and then these are some that have embedded processors, but these days now there's all sorts of uh, embedded processors. Xilinx likes the their microblaze and pico picoblaze uh, processors, and we will use uh, we'll, we're going to use in the SDK labs uh, at the end of the semester we're going to do the micro, we're going to instantiate a microblaze soft core and then program it. At least that's the plan. Um, this is this is um, how some of them can look. Um, SRAM blocks, SRAM blocks, logic blocks. Here are the little I/O blocks all around here, and then apparently some of the clock circuitry in the corners, um, and then so maybe flash memory block, blocks, A to D converter, charge pumps, all sorts of stuff. Anyway, but uh, 
they're all set up differently, obviously. Um, so what do we use them for? Rapid prototyping. Um, final product, if you're not shooting for a maximum speed system. Uh, reconfigurable circuits and systems. Uh, smaller FPGAs are typically CPLDs. We're gonna, we're gonna, we do what's called glue logic, where you have to have uh, two chips talk to each other, but they have different levels, they have different uh, protocols and speeds, and and so so an FPGA can can handle a, a parallel interface between that or a serial interface for that matter. Um, and then things like hardware accelerators, coprocessors. So when when we have some uh, some some uh, straightforward crunching we need to do, uh, we can sometimes set this up um, uh, with uh, with an FPGA. Okay, this is a, our this is our family, the Artrix Seven, and uh, so it is twenty eight nanometer technology. I think now they're they're definitely doing chips with uh, ten nanometer. Uh, I know that the latest, uh, the latest uh, 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 AMD chips and Intel chips are 10 nanometer, uh, but I know that the latest NVIDIA card it was 8 nanometer. So you can see it's just crazy where we're getting, but I don't know that we're gonna, we're we're hitting the we're hitting the hard limit here. Um, the 7 series configurable logic block. Uh, it basically gives you, uh, uh, you have two, uh, well, it says uh, the real six input lookup table technology, and you have, I guess, okay, I, I think I misspoke then. I guess you have du dual LUT fives and that can make a LUT six, and it, but you're going to have to do uh, two slices to get a, a LUT seven. And we're, we'll, back, we'll come back and see that. So um, a slice is four lookup LUT sixes, Eight flip flops. Okay, no, it is LUT sixes. Yeah, I don't know. It's a real six input lookup table. And then, okay, there are, maybe there's some slices that have this LUT five option. Oh no, you can take your six input lookup table and create two LUT fives. That's the deal. All right. Well, anyway, uh, so the slice a, a slice uh, is made up of four LUTs, sixes, eight flip flops. A bunch of muxes and carry logic. Two thirds of the slices are logic slices. One third are memory slices. Uh, and your comp and your your complex logic bl logic block is two slices. So when when it talks about uh, the, sorry configurable logic block, it's two slices. So when you when you when you look at uh, what what's uh, contained. Uh, I think we looked at configurable logic blocks. Let me go back to that slide real quick. Okay, we looked at this earlier. I probably should move this slide down there. So in our Artrix 7, uh, and I'm not sure exactly which one this chip is. This may be our chip, actually. We, there, so there's 215,000 logic cells. Uh, there are 740 uh, DSP slices. So some of those logic cells have DSP slices, and some of them just have the regular slices. Um, so, so, so that's 215, and each of those uh, has two slices. Okay, and then you just saw what those slices are. Let me go back to that. So, uh, so each each of those slices is four lookup, four lot sixes, eight flip flops, a bunch of multiplexers, and carry logic. And again. Uh, two thirds of them are logic slices, and one third are memory slices that that have extra memory cells. And and your 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 uh, configurable logic block has two of those slices in it. So you've got what it was it two hundred and some thousand two hundred two hundred and some thousand of those. Pretty amazing. Um, so here's the Arctic Seven. The, our chip is the seven A one hundred T, and it has okay it has. 15,000 slices, and uh, some of the slices are logic slices, and some are memory slices. So there's 11,000 logic slices and 4,700 memory slices. Uh, so we have 126,000 flip-flops, uh, 594 bytes, uh, kilobytes of shift register. 
we have uh, one point, uh, almost 1.2 megabytes of distributed RAM. And what, by distributed RAM, what they mean is uh, this is if you use your uh, the, 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 the memory in all your uh, uh, lookup tables in slices you're not using for logic, you can, you can also use those as memory storage if you want. Uh, so you have uh, uh, 63,400 six input lookup tables. And of course, a six input lookup table has uh, 64 uh, rows. So you can see that's that's just an, that's a lot of that's a lot of logic. And here's some of the other specs. Um, and again, ours is this X7A100T. And uh, we have temperature ratings and speed ratings. And uh, there's some there's some uh, there's some global transceiver uh, um, that are available that can really go fast. Uh, we have some uh, some mixed signal capability. Um, let's see what else. Uh, the block RAM is about uh, and it's it, it's about four four point eight meg of block RAM. Uh, so that's RAM that's all concentrated in one location that we can program uh, for like a uh, a soft core processor that we might create. Um, so you can see. And something like 101,000 logic cells, 15,000 slices. So there's a lot of, uh, and uh, yeah, and maximal single ended I.O., uh, 300. So there's apparently 300, uh, 300 pins you can use. Uh, and if you want to do differential, you've got 144 pins you can use that way. Um, so... You can see some of the other chips. Here's the Kintex, not the chip we're using, and you can see these are these are uh, these have these are a little bigger, and you get down here to the big ones. So they have uh, they have six point uh, almost six point eight megabytes of uh, of, dis of distributed RAM. Their block RAM is thirty four uh, megabytes. Um, they have 477,000 logic cells, uh, almost 600,000 flip-flops. I mean, it's just amazing the stuff they have. And then here's Vertex, which is the biggest of all. And, oh, look at the number of pins. See, I think we can see pins here. Uh, uh, let's see. I.O., yeah, 300, 400, 500. And then you look here, 850, 1,200. 700, 600, 700, 1,000, 900, 1,100. Amazing. So here's what a DSP slice has. So some of the slices are these DSP slices. Uh, and so you have a pre-adder. You have the 25 by 18 multiplier. Uh, then you have this pattern detector. Uh, there's some pretty impressive things in the DSP slices. And the synthesizer is smart enough to know how to how to use these uh, if if your HDL uh, you know is it looks like it needs to use one of these. Okay, uh, so that pretty much um, that pretty much gets us through uh, the rest of this. Um, we'll we'll pick up uh, we'll pick up unit four and uh, start on that on Wednesday and. Uh, and uh, just continue the march. Uh, let's see. I do want to say a little bit about the laboratory. So let me do that. Okay, so here is lab six. This will be the lab for this week. And um, if you look at this, uh, so first off, remember that you have to use the, the, the C version of the uh, constraint file. Uh, so don't use B. Use C. Uh, and then here's the, uh, the, the word file that is going to guide us. And so let me fix that. Okay, we'll enable editing. All right, so, uh, so in this, what we're going to do in this lab is we're going to use uh, 
we're going to use our seven segment displays. And what we're going to do is we're going to let you input, uh, uh, I believe it's two digits. Let's see. Uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to use uh, the first two seven segment displays to display uh, eight bits, which gives you two hex digits. And then we're going to complement those digits and display those in the last two seven segment display locations. So there actually are, I think there's eight seven segment display locations. We're, so we're only going to use four of them, the, the, the first two and the last two. And, uh, and they're going to be the complement of each other. So in this one, there's a couple things we have to do, um, and it's gonna it takes a little bit of work, but we have to develop a, a clock that that ticks at just the right speed to make this work. Now let let me let me bring up um, let me bring up uh, I'll bring up this and I'll expand it to the whole thing and I'll change it to the camera. And so, yeah, you know, clean this off. And so, what what you have to keep in mind here is, or what what should be kept in mind, but you don't have to, uh, is the fact that uh, yeah, I guess we'll do this. Uh, so here's here's our here are our seven segment displays. So we've got we've got we've got eight of them. So there's display zero, one, two, three, or sorry, one, blah blah blah, seven, six, five. Okay. So, so we have seven here, but I didn't draw them all, and I even there I made it too close together. Okay. Yeah. So we have to drive all these displays. We actually only have uh, we have uh, eight anodes and eight cathodes. Yeah. Now, the anodes uh, are, we have lines, I think it's the anodes anyway, we'll have to get, uh, uh, may have to review this. These drive the segments. And there's eight segments, including the decimal point. The eight cathodes are driven and and anyway so here are here are eight cathodes and I think the I think our actual seven segment indicators are implemented with common cathodes so the so the cathode is common and so to make these, turn these segments on, uh, you have to, you have to set these, uh, you have to set, and these go to all, all the chips, all the seven segment LEDs. So what you do, if you want to display a number, then you, you, you set the cathodes, uh, sorry, you set the anodes. I actually, I think these, maybe these are the cathodes. These may be the cathode, and this and they're and they're common anode displays. Okay, so all the cathodes for all the seven segments are tied together. So all the A segments are tied together. All the B segments. So it's A B C D E F G. And I forget if A. I think A starts on this one, not on the top one. Uh, in any event. When you, when you drive these things, uh, 
let's say you want to display six, okay? So you're going to turn on this segment, the middle segment, and these three bottom segments. Uh, so three of these lines, four of these, one, two, three, four, five of these lines will be on, okay? Plus, plus, or actually, and to turn these on, you have to set them to zero. So zero, 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 and then all the rest of them will be ones wherever they, however they fit together. But notice, so, and then when you want to make this display light up, you turn on the common anode. And you have to set that high. But uh, to do that, because there's a whole bunch of LEDs uh, send, s sinking current through this common anode, we, we can't drive those directly from our FPGA. We have to drive a transistor switch. So this is going to go down through a, through a BJT switch to ground like that, or to actually, or to up to plus BDD. Um, so in that case, I guess we'd use a PNP. In any event, and what the micro controls is, is the actual, the base leg, which has to have a, a, base, tran a base resistor. So because of that, you can, you can turn on whichever segment, or, or however many segments you want, but all of the cathodes will show the same thing. So how would you get where you would write, say, an 8 here and a 5 here? How would you do that? Well, you have to use a technique called multiplexing. You have to, you have to do time division multiplexing. And what you do is you show the 8 for a small amount of time, and then you turn off this display you change the cathode drivers to now to display a 5 and you turn on this display and you show this display for a, a small amount of time and then you switch back and you show this one and you switch back and forth very rapidly and if you switch quickly enough at, at sort of the optimum rate then uh, you'll see both digits nice and nice and brightly illuminated but if you make if you don't do it really well you'll have all sorts of potential problems. So, so let's look at what those problems can be, because that's actually very instructive. And you may run into some of this as you do this lab. So, so, so is there such a thing as too fast in the switching? Well, what do you think? What could be, what could be some of your inherent limits for how fast you can switch? Well, one of those limits is uh, the LED switching time. So if the LED can't switch fast enough, then that's a definite limit. And what happens if you start to exceed this switching time, then the LED will remain on when it's supposed to be off, or it won't be on when it's supposed to be on. And so you have to slow it down so you do not exceed the inherent speed of the LEDs. What, what, what about too slow? What do you think might be a problem with too slow? Well, then, then, the, then the human is going to start complaining because it's going to blink. Or, it's, or, it's, or it's, it seems like it's flashing. Even if it's at a higher rate, it might think of it as a jitter. But they won't like it and they'll complain. So when you design this, when you figure this out, you, you have to play with these speeds. Now when, when we did this, the first year we did this, we had, I had no idea what speed to do this at. Uh, so we, we had to play with it. And we made both mistakes uh, and we learned. So you're gonna benefit from that. You, so, the, uh, 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 so what you want is about right. Now, I, I encourage you to play around with the about right, but I, I've kind of concluded it's about a kilohertz. But you definitely have some wiggle room there, and you might play with it and see if you can make it look a little brighter by going faster or slower, or if, you can, or, or if it starts to have a little jitter or blinky, blinkiness to it, or if, if, if things like that. Now, what are some other things that you have to think about? Well, you also have to think about uh, there's some really important things not to do. One of those is do not 
change the segments when the display is still on. Because if you do, when you run this at a kilohertz or so, you'll start to see streaking. You'll see segments that, that are, they look like they're streaking. Uh, and they're not fully on, they're not fully off, they're kind of blurred. And this definitely is very, it makes the display really ugly. So you don't, you don't want to do this. You want, you want to make sure that what you do, you follow a very strict pattern. And that pattern has to be, the pattern has to be, uh, you first turn off all segments. Uh, well, okay, let's get this, let's get our nomenclature. Uh, so we're going to call the uh, A, uh, we're going to call these segments We're going to call the A, B, C, D, F, G, we're going to call those, we'll call those segments. Okay, and then we'll call each individual indicator we'll call each one of these, um, we'll call these a digit. Okay, so the first thing you want to turn off is all of the digit common common anodes. All right, so you want to do that first, all the common anodes. And then you want to change the segment lines. for next data. So whatever you want to display next, you set that in. And then turn on on the correct digit common an common anode line. And then that'll show the new the new data that you have and um, display it and then you turn turn off that digits common anode and all you turn them all off but you should only have well you might have two or three on but you only turn you turn everything off so turn all all common anodes off yeah off all common anodes and then when you uh, then when you set the new uh, the new data in then you go back you change the segment lines don't change the segment lines when you're when you have any of the anodes turned on and uh, then if and if you do this using a clock of about a kilohertz it'll work okay. Now you could theoretically have an asymmetric clock. You could make the display time longer and the time when you're switching segments shorter. But remember, you still have to keep, you still have to not violate the LED switching time. So, uh, and you don't want to go too slow. So anyway, uh, this is really a fun lab because you can see uh, how your digital alarm clock actually works. Now there are special circuits that are set up to do these, but but we almost never run enough wires to uh, to run uh, separate segment lines to each digit. We almost always put all the segment lines together, and then we turn the digits on and off and multiplex the display because it's it's just a lot more efficient and it works fine. The human eye. Uh, integrates uh, with a, enough of an integration constant or with enough, with a, over enough time that if we get the clock right, uh, 
and we don't change segments when we're powered and we don't do it too fast or too slow that it'll look pretty good and so this is this is this will let you play with this and it's really a lot of fun to do it uh, so that's the lab and hopefully you'll really enjoy the lab all right so i think with that we'll quit and uh and i'll probably see you in lab